uh, program this morning. Please uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we have two very special guests. I kind of entitled it Job Creation Economic Development in the Greater Springfield Area. Uh, I think we'll hit, hit that uh, part of the time anyway. Uh, so our special guests are Karen Davis. Karen is the Director of the Office of City Planning and Economic Development for the City of Springfield. Uh, it's got, what, a year ago, June probably, so a little over a year in the, under uh, Mayor Langfelder. Uh, and uh, has strong banking and housing, uh, and was uh, in Springfield before that. And uh, we also have uh, Greg Coyle. Greg has worked in economic development uh, for a number of years, uh, and uh, most currently is, uh, has a relationship with Sangamon County uh, in, in this field. So we're gonna start with uh, Karen, and then we'll move to Greg. Uh, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, and I want to uh, take just a little moment to thank everybody for coming out this morning. Okay. Uh, as Bob stated, my role is the uh, Director of Planning and Economic Development at the city. And so, kind of in a nutshell, um, our role is to um, manage um, the eight TIF districts that we have in Springfield to manage the uh, enterprise zone um, that we're in partnership with the county. Um, and together we uh, look to create um, a additional incentives and to uh, help the Springfield area uh, not only to uh, develop new but also to redevelop uh, some of what we're calling the core of, of Springfield. So we focus a lot on economic development, a lot on jobs. We focus also on, on housing development. We are the uh, department that receives the federal dollars from HUD, and so uh, we're mandated to um, uh, use those dollars in some of the most blighted um, census tracts in the city, and so I'll talk a little bit about that later. But I wanted to start out by just talking about um, Springfield. The, uh, what we call, and, and to talk about the status of, of economics here in Springfield. As you all know, um, Springfield is a growing and diversified economy. Uh, we're anchored by public administration, healthcare services, retail trade and tourism, and um, we're ever expanding in those particular areas. Our well-rounded economic base is dominated by the public sector, and a lot of the public sector is with uh, government and healthcare, and a, with a wide variety of businesses in the retail and business support sectors. Greater Springfield is also home to roughly about 40 commercial banks and financial institutions with combined assets in excess of $5 billion. Overall, Springfield's economy has remained relatively stable the past several years, despite the national and regional downturns. Ending in June 2006, our unemployment rate is 4.8%. That remains below the national rate of 4.9% and substantially below the Illinois rate of 6.2%. Our major employers in, this, in Springfield include the state government, county and city government, healthcare providers, financial finance, insurance and real estate, retail trade and tourism. Springfield is also fortunate to have 161 statewide associations that are headquartered here. And they provide hundreds of well compensated professionals who perform numerous activities which include advocacy, administration and legislative functions and services on behalf of their members. Healthcare services have provided the most stable growth with Southern Illinois University of Medicine, Memorial Healthcare System, St. John's, or referred to as HSHS, hospital here in Springfield Clinic, and they all continue to grow substantially in their physical footprints. Right now, healthcare is the, in aggregate, is our sing, single largest employer in Sangamon County. To dive down just a little bit deeper, St. John's Hospital is currently undergoing expansion at Madison and, and 9th Street. 
uh, Memorial Health Care um, continues to uh, expand their footprint and recently um, we did see where they've finished the renovation of Hay Edwards School um, at 400 West uh, Lawrence, an estimated $9 million renovation there that will house about 185 employees. So Springfield is really good. It's really good. And not only are we really good, but we also have a lot of what I would consider to be firsts. Uh, we're first with the Learning and Innovation Center here in Springfield. Um, while we, under, we know that that is just one of six in the nation, just recently um, Memorial was, re, um, was given an award that, um, that helped, <clears throat> excuse me, they were just given an award that uh, for their um, quality and safety with their innovation center. And that's something that um, they were competing with hospitals across the nation. So um, again, that's a first for Springfield and that's something that also shows that Springfield is really good. When we look at HSHS St. John's, um, not only was that hospital established in 1878, but it was also the hospital of Mary Todd Lincoln. And so again, Springfield is really good. Uh, we have the Prairie Heart Institute that's under the umbrella of HSHS St. John's and they are number one in their field with a number of cardiovascular research and um, some of the medical procedures that they've done. And likewise, there's Southern Illinois University of Medicine that's a um, nationally accredited medical school that performs world-class cl clinical trials and research programs. So all in all, Springfield is really good, and if you look at all the stats and look um, in any given time, it seems as if uh, our name, our city, and some of our surrounding areas are always on um, some type of a, a national poll. But what I want to have you really think about right now is this quote from Jim Collins in the book he wrote, Good to Great. Good is the enemy of great. So as I've talked about, Springfield is really good. We've done a lot of good things. But with the new administration, we're really focusing on taking Springfield from being good to being great. And so that's really a mindset that we see. And we're really excited about it because we don't look at things as a challenge. We look at things as an opportunity to really move our city forward. So when I talk about opportunities that we have, I want to also kind of look at the analogy of the core. If your core is strong, it will support you. Um, if we look at our, um, when we start um, in grade school, they'll talk a lot about the three R's, which is reading, writing, and arithmetic, because you have to have that foundation to be strong as you move through life in any profession that you're gonna go on, go into. And so we have to have a strong core. And so I talked about all the businesses, all the sectors here in Springfield that are strong and flourishing and they're all within the city's core. We've got our medical district that's in the city's core. We've got horse man that's in the city's core. Um, this, the State of Illinois is in the city's core. You've got county government, you've got city government. We're all domiciled in the city core. And so what we see is an opportunity for us to strengthen our core. Um, it's not by accident that a lot of our, our TIF areas were established in the core of the city because based on um, studies that were done, these were some of the areas that we really wanted to spur economic development. And so we see this as an opportunity. And so when we think about good to great, um, and I wanna share with you some of the activities that the city has right now. We're, d we're looking to we're looking to assess all of our TIF areas so that where we're appropriate, we will launch new pro 
programs to really activate development in those areas. Um, as I talked about before, one of our other programs is the Enterprise Zone. And that Enterprise Zone not, now not only encompasses Springfield, but it encompasses Sangamon County. And so we're looking to do a better job at getting that word out and making sure that people are able to take advantage of that particular program. Um, we launched last year a program for small entrepreneurs um, in a partnership that we have with Justine Peterson. We felt that there was really a gap with some of the small dollar um, funding to start uh, a business and we realized that now with the, the banks under some of the compliance, new compliance um, requirements that they have, that um, sometimes some of the smaller uh, loans for small business may not be where they feel is their, um, where they want to focus their dollars. So we were able to launch that program and to date we've made 55 loans for a total of $297,000. And just to give you an idea about the types of loans that we, we've been able to launch, um, a barbershop, a daycare center, an educato, educational consulting firm, a lawn, current, lawn care firm, um, auto body shop, an event planning uh, business, and so on. But those are just some of the examples that um, we're excited that we've been able to launch. So we're looking now to create additional incentives. We're looking now to create an environment um, in the core where we can support and um, have businesses flourish and also those businesses will be able to um, create jobs for us. When we look around citywide, there are a number of activities that are going on that um, will certainly take us from good to great. Um, you've heard a lot of discussion about the intermodal hub. Um, that work has been discussed for a number of years and it's, uh, we do believe it's finally coming to closure. Um, if you'll remember, that's where we will have um, the Amtrak trains, the freight trains, city buses, Greyhound buses, etc., all coming into one location in the core of the city. Um, we were very um, excited about receiving the Tiger Grant, which will help us um, with the high speed, um, finishing up the high speed rail for a portion of it. That was a $17 million federal grant. And so the list goes on. I saw Katie Davidson in the, um, the audience and, and she there at the uh, Innovation Incubator is another good example of how Springfield has an opportunity right now to go from good to great. So all in all, we're very excited about where we are um, if we kind of take a check after uh, 12 months but I, I want you to, to continue re to remember that good is really the enemy of great. So Springfield is good. We all know that um, Springfield is good, but we really want to take it to the next level to make it great. Um, and having said that, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Bob so that he can um, have Craig uh, talk a little bit about um, what he's going to be doing to kind of help us with this initiative also. Very good. Craig, you're on. <laughs> wow, <clears throat> that's the shortest introduction in the history of mankind, but I like that. That's good. <clears throat> Thank you for being here, everybody. I appreciate it. I was, I was kind of looking around, and I think the, first time, the last time I was on stage, except for in things like this, I played a Swedish policeman in a high school play out at Porta High School in Petersburg. I'm like, okay, well, this is going to bring him back memories, right? So hopefully you'll be nicer than the crowd was that night when we got heckled. Um, Again, thank you for being here. Uh, I serve as a principal partner and chief operating officer of the Development Consortium. TDC is a consulting company that was founded uh, by my partner and I about 10 years ago. And um, it grew out of a need for what we saw as a niche market. We do uh, consulting to local governments and not-for-profit corporations. We do site selection and incentive negotiation for corporations throughout the Midwest and we specialize in enterprise zone uh, applications and administration. As a matter of fact, uh, Karen alluded to it, I guess uh, we did the application in concert with the, the parties here locally that was successful in getting the enterprise zone for Springfield and Sangamon County. So um, it was good to be a part of that initiative. We're also a corporate real estate 
or we do real estate transactions as well as a value added service to our clients and and um, really kind of cover the gamut of all economic development activities where we can, where we can help folks both, both in the private and public sector. A little bit of background for just so you know where I'm coming from so you're not sitting there going, who's this guy and why is he here since you've probably never seen me before. Um, I've been in economic development for about 30 years, as I said, with the, started out with the state of Illinois where I was an area development rep and then ran the major projects group and the business development, industrial development group for the state of Illinois and um, left there in the early 2000s and went over and ran the Economic Development Corporation in Decatur, Macon County until uh, 2013, I guess, when I left to go with our company full time. My partner uh, in the business is located in the Quad Cities. Her full time job is Executive Director of Renew Moline, which is a downtown redevelopment organization. Uh, and she was also a former employee of the Department of Commerce at the state level and served as the uh, foreign trade director for the Department of Agriculture in Toronto. So when you look at the kind of the broad scope of our backgrounds and what we're able to bring to the table, we hope we can add some value to process for folks and shed some light on things from a little different perspective because we've kind of done it all, I guess, at this point in our lives. We've been on the state side, we've been on the local side, we've been on the company side, and we've been on the consulting side. So. That's kind of it in a, in a nutshell in terms of background. Um, we were approached by Sangamon County to kind of take a look at the success and or challenges faced by economic development in the region over the last number of years. And um, so I'm not here as an employee of the county, I'm here as a, a contractor for the county. And, and um, we're starting an initiative where we're basically going to be reaching out to many of you in the audience who are business owners, uh, local government officials, educators, workforce training folks, anybody who basically has a significant impact in the economic development process of the region, to try to get your thoughts on what's worked in the past, what's been successful, um, why, what is it, why was it successful, why did it work, and then conversely, what have the challenges been? Um, we all know we've had some challenges, not all of which have been directly related to whether you're in Springfield or Sangamon County. Frankly, the state of Illinois is not our best friend right now in many respects. And everybody faces that challenge, but it comes down to the point, how do you, how do you make yourself stand apart and be successful in the challenging environment that we face at the state level, and then again, make yourself visible in the national level? So we intend to um, get out and start meeting with folks and having these kinds of conversations, and I, I hope that we have frank conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I hope we have frank conversation about uh, the things that you feel impact the success of this community going forward. And this is not about um, being critical of one or multiple persons or individuals. It's just a big picture perspective. What are we missing, right? And we found that a lot of times businesses um, need, they know what's going on, but they don't always have a way to articulate it, or they don't articulate it because they're too busy, too busy running their businesses. So we're going to try to get a handle on that as well. And I think that'll set the guidelines for the initiative going forward. So you ask, what is the initiative going forward? That remains to be seen, but I think at the end of the day, what it means is that we'll, we'll take this these interview results <clears throat> and our, our local visit results, and you're gonna see trends that will develop fairly quickly. And I think we all know what some of them are, because they seem to be universal, but there may be significant trends that are developing in the workplace and in the business environment that maybe nobody thought about. And those are the ones I think we're really interested in. How do we nail those down? How do we attack those? And how do we become successful in making them impact the economy in a positive way. The one thing that I've always said in the past, wherever I've been, whether it's at the state level or the local level, or even when we talk to our corporate consulting clients, is that economic development in a general sense is one of those weird occupations, if you want to put it that way, where everything that happens in a community impacts its ability to be successful, right? You have to have the infrastructure. You have to have places for businesses to locate. You have to have transportation networks. 
and importantly, you have to have an education system that supplies workers to the employers that they need with the skill sets that they need. So you think about that in kind of the broad context. And you look at some of the challenges that people face, not only in Sangamon County, but in Illinois and across the nation. One of the biggest issues that we hear about is the availability of a trained workforce. Now I'll put on my corporate site selection hat. Every community I go to says, we've got that. Yeah, not so much, right? And I'll give you an example from my Decatur days. Um, at a time when Decatur was at 11% unemployment, we were looking at vacant positions in the two county region of Sangamon and Macon County because the workforces overlap. There's a lot of cross commuting in central Illinois. Most of you guys know that. People going from Bloomington to Decatur and Springfield and back and forth to Jacksonville and Champaign-Urbana, there's all this cross commuting. We looked at these numbers and there were literally thousands of vacant jobs in the two county area at a time when unemployment rates were high. And if you look at the numbers now in Sangamon County, you can go to a number of sites and you can find anywhere between eight and 1,200 vacant jobs, okay? So that's significant. So the question then becomes, why aren't they being filled? And it comes down to, I guess, a simple point, which is folks can't find people with the basic skills they need to do those jobs. So whether that means soft skills, people don't want to come to work every day, maybe they don't pass a drug test, maybe they don't have the educational attainment that they need for certain positions. So we're going to address that. We're going to talk, and by addressing it, I mean talk to folks about it, about what they're experiencing in that, in that arena. And we're going to try to tie all this together to paint a picture of what's actually happening in Sangamon County. Theoretically, that'll be done by the end of September, um, which means we've got some work to do, right? But <clears throat> it leads us to the next phase of the study, which is actually doing some benchmarking with communities and organizations around the country who do economic development well on a county-wide basis. And, you know, the one thing we hear a lot of times wherever we go, and I think it's the same a little bit here, Springfield focuses on Springfield, which they should, Chatham, Rochester, New Berlin, Iliopolis, they all have their own vested interests, Sherman, Williamsville, whatever the case may be. Um, I live in Petersburg. I've lived in Petersburg on and off since 1970. And so, you know, it's a regional economy, okay? And so we want to get the kind of the input related to a dynamic like that to try to tie it into the study and do benchmarking on, again, those, those types of regional geographies. And then come back with the recommendation of, here are some options for you going forward about how you do economic development in your region, or how you can do economic development in your region in what we believe would be a successful way. And um, it's not our job to implement that, it's other people's job to implement that. But we would certainly hope that everyone has an opportunity to provide legitimate input to the process, that there's agreement on the direction forward, and that there's ultimately success. And, you know, I look at this, I've been told, kind of, you're from Springfield, but you're not, and I guess that's kind of true. Um, as I said, I live in Petersburg, but I moved there in 1970 when my father was a teacher and a coach out at Porta, and he was there forever. Football fields even named after him, as a matter of fact. My mother worked at Horace Mann for 25 years, okay? So I remember the days of going to the thrifty drugstore downtown and having lunch or dinner. I remember Myers Brothers and the mezzanine and all the cool things that used to be down there, right? And you see things over time. There has been growth, no doubt about it. But you see things move a lot in Springfield kind of my perception, I guess. Things that used to be on the east side, car dealers, for example, they all move over here. It's new investment, new tax revenue, but it has a significant impact on the other side of town. So those are all things I think people need to take a hard look at and, and see kind of what's missing and why we haven't moved beyond where we are as a community. And I put Springfield and Sangamon County in the same boat as in Austin, Texas, or in Nashville, 
I mean, your state capital, right? In a general sense. And state capital kinds of communities, I mean, in a general sense. And a lot of those state capital communities are much more vibrant and dynamic and growth oriented than what we've experienced here in the last 30, 40 years. So the question becomes why? And I'm not telling you I've got the answer for that by any stretch, right? It's a complicated scenario. I think one of them, you know, Karen probably alluded to, um, we've had state government here forever and probably we became a little complacent because state government's always here and it's always been here. When I worked here in the early 2000s, compared to now, and my wife worked downtown as well, there were three to 4,000 more people working downtown than there are now. And, and you guys know that, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But those are all dynamic shifts in economic impacts that have occurred over time. And so we see folks like me and Norm back there getting older and grayer. And we see our kids, mine who went to Springfield High School, who's now left Springfield effective last week, which really irritates me, to move down to Metro East St. Louis area to further his career goals. I'm going, why are you doing that? Seriously? And the answer is, he believes there's more opportunity down there for his age group and his demographic. Again, not a situation unique to other communities because everybody wants to leave where they grew up for a while, but you don't have to, as I've told him, and you all know this as well. There's opportunity here, and this is a great place to be, and you can go anywhere from here. But I don't know that we've really taken advantage of the synergies that are available to us, and, and I hope that going forward we're able to identify some mechanisms to be able to make that happen in the future. So that's kind of our goal. We're just, uh, we don't have any other agenda than to kind of put the facts out there, to gather information, do the benchmarking, and make some recommendations. Uh, those recommendations will all be completed uh, in theory, I guess, again, by the end of January, and then we'll see what happens from there. Very good, thank you. I'm gonna ask a couple of questions, uh, try to be brief questions and uh, hopefully relatively brief answers. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll open it up. I get to, it, to, okay. To, did you get that? Did you get that? I got it. Um, I'll start with uh, Karen. Uh, when, when a company, uh, two things, I guess. If a company or organization shows interest in Springfield, uh, what does that set in action? What, what happens kind of at that point? And maybe the converse of that, and I know that this gets into a longer discussion, uh, how aggressive is Springfield in trying to let <laughs> the world know, I guess, that there are opportunities here? Um, what exactly is going on that, that Springfield is doing in the broad definition of, of economic development. Thanks, Bob. Actually, that's a really good question. One of the things that uh, the mayor has really uh, charged me with is to make sure that we are being on the aggressive side as it relates to being able to um, market Springfield to uh, other businesses. And so you'll recall uh, back at the budget time um, this year, earlier this year, that one of the um, positions that I asked the city council to give us in my department was a division manager for economic development. And um, we're, we're very grateful that they did approve that. And our goal is to be able to take that person to kind of lead the charge, if you will, for Springfield to be a little bit more aggressive. So um, I kind of see that as a two-part question. You're asking what's going on now. Um, from what I was able to observe, the process really was if, if a company came to uh, the city uh, and they were interested in moving to Springfield, we would, um, in our department, um, help them um, shepherd them through um, our various applications for funding and, and a help that way. But what we really felt needed to happen, again, going from good to great, is that we need to be out knocking on those doors, making those phone calls, et cetera, 
and um, selling, um, having our three minute elevator speech to bring companies here. So what we saw was somewhat of a, of a passive um, process. And so uh, we want to, and we do fully intend to um, really accelerate that and really be able to um, get on the streets, if you will, to bring more employers, more businesses here to Springfield. Very good. Mm -hmm. Craig, uh, it occurs to me that Springfield at least is a little different in a couple of areas. We generate our own electricity right. and seemingly can't sell near enough of it. Uh, and on the other hand, we have one of the kind of world-class medical uh, uh, programs, care in Springfield. Uh, most cities do not have that. Right. Uh, how do we take advantage of those which I would think would be really, really positives uh, as important or more important than much of the infrastructure that's important? I understand that. But is that worth taking advantage of? Is there a market out there where you can tell people you got that and possibly attract new jobs? Well, I, I think there is on the electric side, but CWLP has been, I think, very aggressive. And from what I'm aware of in trying to do that, they're, they're hampered a little bit by cost structure, though, now, right? Because a few years ago, it was a lot cheaper to generate electricity than it is now. So with deregulation in Illinois and the open marketplace in a general scenario, it's they may not be quite ahead of the curve as much as they were. So that puts us in a little different scenario, I'd say. But um, on the medical side of things, I mean, I think there's been initiatives that have been started, but you take a step that have, you know, kind of in a regional sense, put Springfield on the map, but then you take a step back, and at the end of the day, you're competing against the Peorias with a medical school from U of I and a big medical complex. You're competing with the Carls and Champaign. You're competing with St. Louis. So you've got to find the synergies and find out what businesses can take advantage of the resources that are here. I, I think we've had some scenarios where there's been some missed linkages between research and actually implementation of product development, and so that might be an opportunity for the future as well. Okay. Very good. Uh, we'll open it up, <clears throat> and uh, we've got a mic here, uh, and Michelle, can you help move that around then? John, <laughs> start with John. Um, uh, my question has to do with the uh, workforce readiness aspect. You said every community claims they have it. Well, I'm curious in terms of every community or our community pitching that to pro prospective employers, by what criteria or uh, ranking or just how would we evaluate so that we can make an honest presentation, both for our own understanding and a legitimate uh, ask for prospective employers about what we have to offer? I don't have any idea how we might do that, but I understand that it's got to be more detailed and more specific than just, well, here's how many people we have that are unemployed and ready to go to work. And on the flip side of that, for a sort of a part B, you mentioned, I think the number was 1,200 uh, open jobs in the area. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, evaluation or, or acknowledgement that some of those jobs may be open, but they're not being filled? And I'm thinking about a lot of government jobs where the budget restricts filling all the positions that are open, but they may be required to post the jobs. And the same thing may be going on in private industry where they've got some open spots, but for budget considerations, they're just holding off right now. And those jobs that I'm describing, they aren't really open. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, the, the question about the workforce availability is a good one because it, it, I'll put my site selector hat on now, right? Uh, when we go into a community, we have specific occupations that we look at, and we're looking for specific skill sets for those variable occupations. So. I'll just throw some out there. It doesn't mean it's applicable to Sangamon County by any stretch, but say our, our business needs CNC machinists, our client needs CNC machinists. How many do you have available? How many do you have that are in your training pipeline? What is your training pipeline? What are the wage rates? Starting, midpoint, ending, those basic kinds of things. And what kind of implementation strategy do you have to take people who are interested in that career path at the beginning levels and move them into full-time positions within the next X number of months or years, right? 
So it's those detailed kinds of things that really help us as a site selection group focus in on defining whether you have that available or not. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but you can apply that to any other occupation as well that, that may be needed depending on the targeting of your business sectors on your attraction program or if a prospect just drops in and says, I'm interested in your community. You need to be able to tell them that. And um, the ones who have a good handle on that, I mean, you can just tell, right? They've got it for you. It's hard data and they have a record of success in terms of supplying those workers to other businesses. So that's one thing, I guess, as it relates to that. What was your other question? I'm sorry. The other question was what? Oh, the open jobs, right. <clears throat> I think that's true to a point, but the numbers that we look at are off of aggregate, kind of an aggregation websites and other kind of open source websites. So typically there are ones that are available and they are hiring for. Um, I, th I think that we kind of discount what I would call, you know, the blind opportunities like you alluded to and, and don't put those in the numbers. So um, I, I would view those as pretty accurate. Karen. I wanted to respond to um, the question also about how you know um, the work, when you have the workforce, how you know how to prepare individuals for the potential jobs. We have a number of examples here in Springfield right now. A couple months ago, um, if you'll remember, Lincoln Land um, did receive a large do donation to really expand their aviation school because we could see that there were going to be some big jobs coming in that we were not going to be able to fill that need. And so Lincoln Land was able to expand their um, program there. But also, in a broad sense, we work a lot with the community college because that's Lincoln Land. We're very fortunate to have them here in Springfield. And they do a lot of that tracking as it relates to um, the workforce and the, and the necessary training and the trends that are, that are going on in the market, particularly here in Springfield. So we rely on them. We also know from the what we are preliminary conversation, excuse me, with the medical field that um, we know that, that, that nurses are uh, in demand, huge, huge demand. So UIS j did, I believe, just start their um, nursing school uh, in unison with the University of Illinois in Chicago. But we knew um, because employers were going outside the area to hire nurses. And so that was one way we, you know, we met that need. So there are another, a, a number of mechanisms we use to see where the need is. And that's how we start preparing um, now so that, you know, in the future we can be able to meet that need and, and to keep those jobs here in Springfield. Another question? Yes, mm -hmm. go ahead. Regarding the 1,200 jobs, how did you find them? How do you know where they are? If I'm unemployed, which I'm not, but if I am, how do I find that diversity of jobs that you're talking about? And if, we're, if there's not one site, is it something the city could do to set up a website where all the people could come and post their jobs that says what the skill needs are and what the starting pay is? Yeah, I mean, a, a basic site, which I think most people are, if, if they're unemployed in particular, are aware of is employment security. They've got an aggregate, an aggregation site that shows you the jobs that are available that they're aware of. And it's by county and it kind of covers the gamut. And then there's a lot of other sites like Indeed and, you know, those normal yeah. kinds of sites that you hear about on TV that there's some crossover of the vacancies, but when you kind of compare them, you start seeing which ones are legitimate and they're across all platforms like Indeed and Monster and those types of sites. And then you can start getting the picture of what's available. But I'll check into that comment you had about the city maintaining a site. Okay, we'll and look just link that. to employment security and you got it. And I think that's, that Ron's back there. He can help you, right? Questions? <laughs> Yeah, Kim. Yeah, this is kind of more big picture kind of question. Mm -hmm. When we talk about economic development, are we thinking of it, this is kind of a chicken and an egg. Are we doing economic development in and of itself because we want 
people the opportunity to make money and develop and have careers? Or are we talking about economic development in terms of what it does for the, you know, Springfield as a community, the quality of life? And so you get into a kind of a chicken and egg. We want to have good basic services so that we can get companies to come here and people to be engaged in economic activity. But we also, you know, want to have good basic services so that that makes it, you know, that makes it attractive. But then, if we have the economic development, then that trickles down to good basic services. And so, you know, is one driving the other, or is that just, you know, something that, you know, political scientists worry or philosophers worry about as opposed to people to, on the street? You know, what what is the big picture in terms of why it's good to grow? I can tell you're a political science professor. Um, and I wish I'd have had you in college, actually. Um, it is a chicken and egg thing, but I mean, at the end of the day, you have to be prepared before you're going to get job development, right? So that infrastructure has to be in place. You have to have the basic resources in place anymore because businesses uh, at least our clients and the ones that I've dealt with over the last 20 years, the majority of them, unless it's a major project of some sort where they have some lead time planning, find themselves in these situations where because of economic circumstances or whatever the business circumstances that they're dealing with, they wait to make an investment. And they wait. And they wait. And then all of a sudden, it's like we've got to do this now. and they start looking at opportunities that are available to them immediately to be able to satisfy their demand for location. And when they do that, you have to be ready for them. And uh, so we, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but we, we tend to focus on the site selection side of things on communities that can meet our demand immediately. Uh, somebody who tells me, well, we're, we'll get the infrastructure there in you know, a year, that's not gonna work for me. I need, I need it there now or I need it there quicker than that, and I need you to tell me how you're going to get it there. And um, it's really important in the competitive nature of our business, I guess, to be able to do that. Any response? Yes. I wanted to echo what Craig said um, about being ready um, when the companies come. One of the reasons that we're looking at all of our TIFs right now is, with the exception of the downtown TIF, we're not receiving funding requests. And we believe that part of that reason is because of what I said before about we really want to be proactive um, to be able to uh, attract businesses, but also when we're looking at those specific sites and being able to put in those subsidies, we need to do that right now. And that's something that's going to be very critical as we look to attract people, we do have to be ready to go. And so that's really a, an assessment that we're gonna have to do, be ready, and then, then go out and say, also looking at company profiles, because um, if it's a company that needs a freestanding building, they typically go into the size square foot building. Okay, where in the city do we have that? Is that somewhere where we have subsidies already set up and can we go out and get them? And so it's really kind of a change in our mindset to be a little bit more aggressive and to be ready because um, it's a time now, as Craig said, that we're in competition with other cities and we have to be ready. And I think it also is about we all have to be ready to assist. While I said Springfield is good, it's really good, but in order for us to go great, we really need um, those of you that are here, I see you as our spheres of influence in the city, but the city, we have a role, but also I think as business owners, um, you have a role also, and I really think we're gonna have to go hand in hand to be able to take the city to being great. Mm -hmm. Yes, over here, Michelle, on the end of the... As some of you know, I'm a candidate for state representative, and uh, one of the things I hear most about is the state, and sometimes even uh, the city, fails to have a five or ten year plan, which is what most businesses even look for. 
And obviously the stability that we're failing to see in state government right now is one factor. And so a two-part question. First is what types of things should we be doing at the state level uh, from a policy perspective that would help attract businesses? One of the comments I heard from the Manufacturers Association was we allowed the research and development grant or tax credit to go away, uh, expire, and so as a result, a lot of businesses, that's one of the first things that they're looking for before they would even consider Illinois. The second question is, as I've been researching uh, economic development programs around the country, one of the programs I'm most intrigued by is Startup New York, uh, which has just started in the last couple of years. Uh, which creates a 10-year uh, tax-free incentive for businesses to start up or expand or move to New York uh, as, as long as they also partner with a local university. And so I wanted to know if any of you had heard about this program or thought that it might have merit here in Illinois also. Start with Karen. Actually, I haven't heard of that specific program there in New York, but we have looked at models where there have been additional incentives to really help businesses, not only kind of to get their foot in the door. Uh, right now, Champagne has a program where um, if you're a um, budding entrepreneur starting your business, they will, uh, the city will come in and help you make sure that you get um, your legal um, person on, on board, your accountant, pay for your QuickBooks, you know, kind of et cetera. So I think um, there are a lot of programs we could probably employ, and we're looking at all of those. The first thing we did was our Justin Peterson program because we did feel that there was a gap for the smaller dollar loans uh, to start businesses. But um, I, think, um, I think we have an op a golden opportunity right now to put together programs that, that will help us here in Springfield. I think we have a huge slate of incentives and opportunities, but we, we have to really sit down and be serious and then all work together to get it done. Mm -hmm. So on the state side of things, we could spend all day talking about that, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the thing that's most important, I mean, we've worked in multiple states, so the thing that really stands out are those states that have some level of predictability in their budgeting process and some level of predictability in their tax policy and some level of predictability in the cost of doing business in a general sense. Right now in Illinois, we sort of have that, but not really, <clears throat> because some of the programs are consistent, like the Enterprise Zone program has been renewed on a statewide basis. People are applying for those. They're starting to be established. So we have some level of predictability out there for corporate corporations and businesses who take advantage of that across the state. On the other hand, the EDGE tax credit, the Economic Development for a Growing Economy tax credit, which is a 10-year tax credit that's based on the amount of wages paid by an employer, sunsets on December 31st. And there's no replacement for that. Uh, so uh, you, you move over to the training side on the state. Most of those training funds have been gutted because of the revenue situation at the state level. So if you're, if you're looking at a location in the state of Illinois, number one, you have to be there for your business, right? Number two, you're going to, honestly, you're taking a risk about what's going to happen in the future until folks start focusing on solutions in the big building over there and set policy that's beneficial for the long-term benefit of our employers and our, our folks in the in the entire state. And right now we don't have that because everybody's too busy arguing to focus on solutions. The, the last time we were at the Capitol talking about potential legislation, incentives were looked at by some legislators as a cost to the state. Well, there is no cost if there's no benefit and there's no job development, right? You're supposed to be incenting job development. Um, on the other side of that, though, I will tell you that the majority of our clients' incentives play a piece in the decision process or part of the decision process, but that's not the driver. What it comes down to is, do you have the place to put the facility? Do you have the workers that I need? Are they trained? Can they come to work on time? Can I get the financing for my project if it's not already financed? And once you have all that, 
then what's my tax claim going to be like in the state and in the local community, and what do you have available to offset those startup costs for us? And you have to be able to articulate all that. And um, I think Springfield does a good job of, and Sangamon County in a general sense does a good job of doing that. We're struggling a bit on the state level in that arena. Questions? In the back? Way back. One more after that. Assuming we get fairly brief answers. These are uh, city related. Uh, one, an observation. The, I believe the city's primary source of revenue is from the sales tax. And sales tax is uh, not being generated in the core. Uh, secondly, I uh, wondered if you'd address the dearth of single family building permits in the city. You know, actually, um, I didn't get those uh, numbers to bring with me, um, but in terms of single family development, the last time um, the permits, excuse me, that I looked at them, um, we, we had concern because the city of Springfield was really lagging behind some of our um, the Chathams and, and other smaller air, um, municipalities outside the city. So um, that, that was a concern for us. But we are lagging behind with our single family starts. One more question, straight back. Yep. Uh, in light of that happy picture you just painted for us, Craig, uh, my question is, have you seen an increase in project leads at all with, with the problems that we're having in the state of Illinois? I know that the leads have been down for quite some time. Yeah, leads, leads in a general sense are down. Um, there tends to be more activity in the northern half of the state than in downstate. That's a function, I think, of volume and population and all that. But um, if you talk to the economic development folks around the state, leads in general are off from what they had been. We can do one more real quick one if you have something. Yes, right here. This is sort of along this whole line that we're, we've been talking about, and Tony kind of touched on it at the state level, looking at the local level from your site selector point of view. What would be your most critical um, or, or our greatest asset from Springfield that we offer, um, and then kind of our biggest deficiency? And from both of you, what your thoughts are on that? Start with Craig. Do you gonna make me go first? Really? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. You got a, you got a <laughs> minute. I got a minute. Well, wow. oh, you're trying to tell me I talk too much. Okay. Um, I think uh, the, the biggest asset, obviously, is location, and that kind of goes without saying. You're at a crossroads and easy in, easy out. Lots of networks and highway and rail, and to some degree, air and opportunity for growth in all those sectors. I think that's really important. The amenities that are available in terms of supporting population in the medical industry, those types of things. Office capabilities in terms of office employment, I think that's strong. <clears throat> the challenges uh, tend to be, um, it's, uh, tends to be a kind of disparity of, uh, disparity is not the right word, there's a large separation of talent, I think. There's a, there's a lot of folks who have a lot of skills and a lot of folks who kind of lack some skills and seems to be missing a lot in between. So we, I would say there's a significant portion of the population that somehow we need to kind of get the skill levels up a little bit. Karen, Workforce. 30 seconds. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'd say affordability. Um, <clears throat> Springfield has certainly been touted as, an, and um, we're affordable. Our housing uh, is very affordable. It's an affordable place to live. And then I, um, all of our, um, our medical care is good. I think overall it's a great community to live. Um, in terms of, um, I believe you said, you know, kind of our worst asset. We've been hearing this a lot, that the, the people in Springfield don't do not tout all of our attributes and so there are people here in Springfield or will say to um, individuals who move from out of town why did you do that why are you here and so that has been kind of disturbing we've heard that from a lot of people so um, that that we don't believe in ourselves so again we're, want, we're trying to go from good 
good to great. Please thank uh, Karen and Craig for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. And we will see you the end of September. Thank you.